Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another of our Green Thumb Gardening series, our uh, Harris County Public Libraries collaboration with the Harris County Master Gardeners Association. Today's April 18th, and we have got a great show for you. It is Tips for Great Lawns. Tips for Great Lawns. A uh, couple of things, uh, just I want to remind everybody real quick, we have another show coming up next month. Um, that's going to be on May 16th, and that will be Gardening with Less Water, and although it looks like it might be getting ready to rain out here right now. You never know. We could be in another drought. Hopefully not, but we will want to make sure you uh, mark your calendars for that. That's going to be on May 16th, Gardening with Less Water. And let's see here. Also, if you have any questions uh, for today's presenter, uh, please enter those into the um, Facebook. If you want to put those on Facebook as you're wherever or wherever you're watching this, and we will definitely get to those uh, and answer every question, uh, either live or on the stream. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and uh, bring in our uh, our, uh, our main speaker, uh, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Robin Kendrick Yates. Uh, he's a physician's assistant with a master's degree from Nebraska Medical Center, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, he retired from MD Anderson Cancer Center after a 20-year career in pain management. And although his career was extremely rewarding, he found out that he was burned out. Robin has found, though, healing in gardening with plants that are native to greater Houston areas. So, uh it is very good to see you, sir. How are you doing, Robin? Doing great, John. Thank you. Very nice uh, great. Hey, Robin, do me a favor. Go ahead and pull your microphone down just a little bit so we can hear you just a little bit better. There you go. Uh, good? Oh, perfect. There we go. All right. Okay. We want to cool. hear everything you have to say. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, also, I know we wanted to pro, uh, to promote one other thing real quick. Uh, that was this, I believe. Um, let's see. We have a on Wednesday. Um, you have tip, uh, an in-person program. Is that correct? Yes, Wednesday on the 19th. And I'll be telling, I got I have a slide for that in just a moment. Okay. A workshop yeah. on alternatives. Yes. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So kind of the same subject, but we'll, we'll get into that too. Well, yes. all righty. We'll tell you what, let's uh, once again, remind everybody, if you have questions, please, please, please get those in, uh, uh, type those in and we will, uh, we will get to those later, but without further ado, uh, what do you say we uh, get this started? <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you, John. Hi, and welcome to our April edition of the Green Thumb Lecture Series. Thank you for joining us today. I'm a Harris County Master Gardener, a volunteer dedicated to communicating gardening knowledge and resources to the citizens of our lovely state. This presentation was originally prepared by Candy Friday and Jean Pfeffer. I have made minimal updates and revisions and will be presenting for you today. It is my hope that each of us will find something useful for our lawns and yards. Next slide, please. This is the calendar that John was just referring to, our 2023 Green Thumb Gardening Lecture Series. Please note next month by Jean Pfeffer on gardening with less water, one of our very precious resources. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you to join me tomorrow at Harris County Master Gardener's Genoa Friendship Demonstration Garden, April 19th at 9 a.m. The registration link will be posted in the chat. Also, uh, it'll be coming up on the screen there. We will discuss and learn to identify different native turf grass alternatives, and each participant will go home with several plants for their own yard. How cool is that? More on this later. Next slide, please. Thank you. First, I would like to acknowledge the native people who inhabited this land for thousands of years, coexisting with the native flora sustainably. The Ekokisa, Karankawa, and others were displaced. Many lost their lives and their land, as well as their culture was taken from them. I would like to honor them today by opening the discussion on facing wrongs done in the past and moving toward healing and restoration in the here and now. Next slide, please. We love our lawns. A 2005 study by NASA, which is just down the road from me here in Clear Lake, determined that 63,000 square miles of turf grass are in the United States. That was almost 20 years ago, making it the single largest irrigated crop that we have. It's covering an area larger than the state of Georgia. Bottom line, healthy soil with appropriate management. I like to consider it like Goldilocks and the three bears. Not too much, not too little, but just right. Whether you're talking about soil, water, 
fertilizer, and sun will give you the best chances for a, a lawn that's to be desired. And we'll be talking about cultural practices that can help. Next slide, please. Here for a master gardener in Harris County, we have the question line and the top most eight questions that are asked regarding lawns are these regarding which grasses, how to mow, watering, fertilizing, weeds, pests, diseases, and alternatives. And we're gonna look at each of these in detail. Next slide, please. First question, which grasses are best for the greater Houston area? In the United States, there are two types of turf grass used in the United States. Warm season grasses, which grow best in temper soil temperatures of 80 to 95 degrees, and cool season grasses, which grow better in 60 to 75 degree soil temperature. Well, as you know, here in Southeast Texas with our heat, warm season grasses are what's recommended and will be the focus of this presentation. The most common turf grass in Texas is Bermuda. In our area here in the greater Houston area, St. Augustine is the predominant variety. And of St. Augustine, you want to get a variety that is need that is more adapted to this area. And one that is, is a Floritam. It's more shade tolerant, has a wide leaf blade, yet it doesn't handle traffic well. In fact, tolerances, let's look at the different tolerances of these grasses. Next slide, please. So if you look at St. Augustine, you see it, it is shade tolerant. And of all the warm season grasses, it is the most shade tolerant. And it handles drought fairly well, not so much with high traffic. And it doesn't do too well in the cold, but it's if you get a disease resistant variety, it can be highly resistant. Then you have Bermuda grass, which doesn't do well in the shade, really good in the drought, does well with traffic and okay with cold and disease. Then you look at Zosia, which is not as common here. You might wonder why, because it looks like it's good in all those categories. Well, it's pretty expensive. And so it's not as commonly used, but it is another option. So those are our choices. Next slide, please. And you can see of the three grasses, uh, St. Augustine is A, Bermuda, B and Zosia is C. You can see each one is a denser than another or one is coarser or finer. And so you see each of these grasses are the options that we have here. And so it's recommended that you find one for your area that is adapted and your local county extension agent can help you with that. Next slide, please. Next question is most commonly asked is when and how high should I mow my lawn? Did I get the, uh, so I just want to make sure I'm on the right slide here. I apologize, Robin. Is this uh, where we're at right now? Keep going. Ah. Uh, One more. There you go. Awesome. Uh, sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. So when and how high should I mow my lawn? Well, most of us don't have a critter like this goat, but what we do is it's important to mow our grass at the proper height. We should never take more than one third of the leaf in one particular mowing. Mowing lower means mowing more frequently. It's going to take more time, more resources, more money, but it can also shorten the roots. So it's important to let the blade grow. If for St. Augustine, at least two and a half, three inches. Some recommend even up to four inches for St. Augustine. That allows the roots to grow deeper and for the, uh, the leaf to actually shade the surface of the turf to help prevent weeds. And then sharpening, sharpening the blade of your mower. That's an important thing that we often overlook. And an important thing I like to recommend is mulching your leaf clippings, the blades, the clippings of the, from the mower blade. You can decrease your fertilizer needs. And this is what I call part of a circular economy mulching in place. And when I'm gardening, I like to mulch whatever I'm cutting, trimming, and let it mulch in place because that plant took those nutrients from the soil to make that blade or that flower or that stem. And if you let it biodegrade back into the soil, you have just decreased your nutrients that you need to replenish for the soil. So I consider it mulching in place, Chop and drop is another way some of my gardening friends call it. Uh, why spend money when I can use what I already have and prevent the need for 
more landfill space. Next slide, please. Our next question that we get asked is when and how much do I need to water my lawn? Well, it all depends upon what are your expectations for your lawn. Do you want to just have your lawn have minimal acceptable appearance, put it through moderate stress? Or are you only concerned that it survives the drought? You'll let it become stressed, but it's going to survive. Well, here in the Houston area, approximately one inch per week is what is needed. And that's typically what we get on average. We get about 50 inches of rain per year. And so you may not need to supplement as much as we do. We typically tend to overwater our lawns. And so it depends upon our own expectations and upon how many days of sun, what the temperature is, and whatever rainfall that we do get. We should water only when it needs it, not just water it because it's it's watering day. It's, just, it's that day of the week. No, we water it when it needs it. Uh, when the turf shows signs of wilt, basically when your footprint doesn't rebound when you walk through it, you can tell that you need to water. And when we water, water deeply to the top four to six inches of the soil. Next slide, please. This slide shows that deep watering means deeper and stronger roots. Light watering produces weak root systems and that leaves your grass more susceptible to stress, disease, and pests. The goal is to water for the first four to six inches. And that means for soil that is healthy, okay? For compacted soil and clay soil, that you may need to use a cycle and soak method to prevent runoff. And if you have questions about that, we can talk about that more. In the winter, it's important to reduce watering and allow the grass to be dormant. That's a normal cycle of nature and only water in dry periods. Morning watering is best as far as timing because the turf is less stressed at that time. And please prevent water runoff whenever you can. You don't want the water running off into the street or sidewalks or parking lots. Next slide, please. Next question we're often asked is how often and what kind of fertilizer do I use on my lawn? You can see from the images that uh, proper application is important. One side is overdone, the other is underdone. You can see the burned uh, grass on the left and on the right is under nutrient. And so how do I know what and how much fertilizer to use? What we recommend is a soil test. If you've never had your soil tested, it's very simple to do. And we will post the link and how to, to show what to do and how to do it and where to send your soil test. This is recommended uh, initially and every th three years, typically, uh, for a fertilizer, then the recommendation will come back from that result. And a slow release and organic fertilizer are better because if the fertilizer goes to work instantly, then you can cause overgrowth. Then you'll have to do extra mowing and a high risk of extra thatch development and pest can grow. So be careful during your application, apply it only to the turf and don't let it go onto the pavement. Uh, wash off, runoff is a, a big problem for eutrophication or the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. And we want to do anything we can to help prevent that. And apply it evenly, take half of what's recommended and apply it in one direction going back and forth. Then start at 90 degrees from that and go the other way with the other half. And as I mentioned earlier, you can cut, you decrease your fertilizer needs in half. Instead of doing in the spring and fall, you can probably omit one of the other by mulching your grass clippings. Next slide, please. Well, five, what do I do with weeds? How do I control weeds? Well, we have found that the best defense against weeds is a healthy lawn and integrated Pest Management, IPM, is something that my colleagues, uh, thank you, Karen and Jessica, for being here to post these informative links in the chat for you. The most important thing that we can do are the cultural aspects. We tend to think of, well, what chemical do I need to take care of this pest or this weed? 
<clears throat> and we've been taught to think that way, but it's, it's more helpful to think of how can I prevent these problems? And so culturally to prevent weeds and other diseases and insects, uh, first have an adapted species of turf grass for your area, and then use the minimum amount of nitrogen fertilizer, irrigate properly, aerate the soil, and remove or prevent thatch. And so those are some of the best things that we can do to help prevent. When we do need to use a, um, a herbicide for weeds, it's best to use a spot treatment and use as little as possible and always read the directions on the label. They'll tell you specifically what weeds they're for and when to apply them and how much. Next slide, please. Okay, number six. What are these critters and how do I manage them? Since cinch bugs, they affect St. Augustine primarily. They mostly do most of their damage in hot, dry summers. Chemical control can begin in early summer. So if you know that this is something that you see in your lawn, the time to treat is early part of the summer. <clears throat> then for grubs, the larvae of the May and June bugs, they naturally are present in turf, and healthy turf can have this. Um, it's recommended to treat only if you find more than four grubs per square foot. And you chemically treat in July for our area. Please consult with your local nursery that sells pesticides, your county extension office, and other professionals for pesticide recommendations. Always read, understand, and follow the directions of the product. IPM Integrated Pest Management begins with proper cultural practices for a healthy lawn. Next slide, please. Then seven, how do I manage diseases? Well, brown patch, it's a common problem here in Houston. Most yards are going to have this at some time or other. It's a fungal disease of St. Augustine. It attacks a spring and early fall, primarily our damp seasons. And it shows circular damage, what they call a smoke ring on the outer edge where the leaves are easily pulled from the stem. Things to do, adjust drainage. Good, adequate drainage is essential. And apply a preventative fungicide in the early fall if needed. Then take all root. It's a serious fungal disease of St. Augustine and Bermuda grasses. And it's active in humid climates any season. So that's basically us. It, has, it can be a large affected area. The roots are damaged and the stolons easily pull away from the roots. So for it to help prevent it, important, good drainage. And if this is your problem, raising the pH to 6 to 6.5 instead of a more neutral or alkaline. And then a preventative fungicide in the fall if this is a problem in your yard. Next slide, please. And we're ready for questions. Good, good. All right. We got a couple here. Let's uh, me get a move this uh those are get us up there. Okay, um, couple of things. Um, I had questions about on the grasses that we were talking about. The there's a, a one thing you see around here in Houston around Harris County a lot is the around golf courses that really small grass. Now, do you know now but I've also seen those in people's yards before. Um, like the you know what I would call golf course grass. Mm -hmm. Is that which that's is that the as you play with the zoysia? Is that how you said it? Zoysia? Is that I believe so. I believe so, John. I believe they do use that in golf courses on, okay. the, on for the fairways and such. Mm -hmm. And is there a grass that like you know is more uh, like hard, what's the hardiest or like the best choice of grass? You know, if, or, you're, if you're like, let's say you just, just got here yet going from no, no yard, like the easiest maintenance, the one that's going to uh, have the most, uh, uh, which one's going to live the longest. <laughs> that's <laughs> not an easy amount of maintenance. <laughs> so I'm going to use the master gardener standard response. It depends. <laughs> okay. okay. There is no, there is, first of all, there is no native grass that's going to meet all those requirements. Okay. This area used to be coastal tall grass prairie. Right. Now there's less than 1% of that left. That means basically we wiped it out. It's gone. Okay. okay. There are a few remnants left. And so in a coastal tall grass prairie, there are no short 
turf grasses. Gotcha. <laughs> so what we're doing okay. is we're trying to bring something in with these turf grasses that we're, we're actually, I call it, we keep them on life support. We fertilize them to keep them alive and we kill everything else by herbicide, fungicide, and, and insecticides. Mm -hmm. And so basically when we're talking about these turf grasses, we need to, use, need to be aware that we're trying to do something that is not native and it's not natural. And so we're going to have to support it. And the best way to do that is to decide what are my needs and what are my expectations? So I, I don't have a, uh, one quick, simple answer to it. That's a good question, a very important sure. question that all of us have at some time or other. And it's a very complicated answer. And it's one that's also in, in flux as far as right. even, my, even my own personal response changes from month to month and year to year as I learn more. Right. Well, okay. Maybe this will be an easier question. That okay. seems like uh, uh, in the last, uh, you know, we've had some really hard freezes um, in the last few years, occasionally, now, obviously there's nothing you can do about the, you know, the hard freeze if it happens and there, you certainly right. can't, you know, cover up your yard, to, you know, to, to save a yard. What about after uh, uh, that? It, you know, what would we do? You know, we had a lot of grass die when that, I mean, in our yard, what, how do you, is there a thing, anything you can do to kind of help facilitate regrowth? So what I would do is if you have an area that dies is use that as an opportunity to consider what do I want here? What, what, what do I need? What does my neighborhood need? And then think of the different options. And some of those options will be in the alternatives that we're talking. <clears throat> but if I'm going to put, if I'm going to put the same thing back in, if I'm going to replug St. Augustine, then I might look at, do I need to improve the drainage? Okay. Let me test the soil. Let me see what the soil needs first. Because oftentimes we forget to look at where the grass is actually going to do its life. It's going to live in the soil. Mm -hmm. And I recommend if folks haven't, they listen to Deborah Caldwell's lecture in January on the soil food right. web. And there she talks about all that we need to do to have the soil healthy. Because if the soil is sick, the grass is going to be sick. And so if we... One of the things I learned from her talk is compaction is such a problem with our soil. Okay. And if we take, take mindful that 25% that of our healthy soil is air, then we're going to treat it a little differently. And it makes a difference in how we respond and what we do for it. Okay. Uh, and one last little question here. Um, uh, tips for pet owners. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, the dogs love to run around in the backyard. Um, and, uh, you know, you want to clean up after, you know, I'm sure that that definitely helps, but, uh, you can't help but sometimes get the, uh, the isolated spots that, the, uh, have any, uh, it, like just watering it right afterwards help, or is it just, uh, one of those things that if you got dogs, you, you might have some brown spots. Well, as a, as a pet owner, I don't have a dog, but I have grand dogs and, uh, having raised children, when you have pets <laughs> and kids, you have pets and kids. Anything mm -hmm. else is, ex is extra, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I lower my expectations. If I'm going to yes. have, like my daughter just moved into a land, to, into pear land, and she has two dogs. And I put in all kind of native flowers for her. I come in a couple months later and they're all tore up. But guess what? She's happy, the dogs are happy. I'm happy. Okay. And so that's, we have to readjust our expectations according to our <laughs> needs. And so if we have pets, we're not going to have a stellar, perfect, you know, magazine cover right. lawn. Robin, that's not the answer that people who want it all want to hear, but uh, we'll tell you what, let's uh, uh, keep the questions coming in uh, folks on Facebook. Obviously we're having the master gardeners help out answering those as we go, but let's get back into it and we will uh, uh, touch base again at the, uh, the end of the program. We'll ask, answer any more questions that you guys, the, the viewers might have. So please keep those coming in. And with that, let's see, let's get you back going on here. All right. Cool. Thank you, John. So the eighth question that we're asked is, are there suitable alternatives in the Houston area? As we've talked already, the lawn is the largest irrigated crop in our country. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we spend 270 billions of gallons of water a week to keep it alive. We use more pesticides on our lawns than agriculture uses on its crops. The main purpose for our turf grass is aesthetic value, not for food. 
So I ask that we consider decreasing the amount of lawn dedicated to turf grass. Take an area of your turf, your St. Augustine or whichever you have that's not thriving. Consider your needs and be creative. Consider the ecosystem benefits of native plants. You can see next last month's presentation on the benefits of native plants. Next slide, please. So here are some alternatives. Alternative plants, planted gardens, water features, natural materials, and permeable hardscapes. We'll look at each of those. Next slide, please. So ground covers. There are other options for ground covers, and these are Texas superstar plants that are available. And you can see on our website, <clears throat> our EarthKind website, that are my colleagues will post for you that we have a plant guide that will show you superstar plants that Texas A&M has researched and found that these plants grow well here in the state of Texas. Now, it depends upon which area of the state, particular plants, but these are been proven to be good plants for Texas. So this is another option to help replace turf grass. Next slide, please. My favorite thing to consider are native ground covers. And this is one option. This is lyre leaf sage. It's a perennial plant. It's a tolerant sun and shade. It's low to medium water requirements. It grows one to two feet tall and can be mowed when it's gone to seed. It's an evergreen ground cover. And as you notice, this rosette has purple veining through it. Uh, it does that in the winter. And it'll be green and purple through the winter, providing winter color. In March and June, it has a lavender bloom that the pollinators and hummingbirds love. Next slide, please. You have probably seen this. It's often called buttercup, pink evening primrose, Anethra speciosa. It grows in full sun to part shade, one to two feet high. It's a great ground cover, a turf grass alternative. It's a perennial, so it'll keep coming back each year. The blooms are pink to white, and it blooms from February through July. It's a nectar source for pollinators. Seed, seed is food for birds and other mammals. Next slide, please. This is powder puff, sensitive plant, Mimosa strigolosa. It's a ground cover. It grows in full sun to part shade, and it's a legume, so it fixes nitrogen to the soil. And it grows a maximum of one feet high. It's usually about six inches high. And it has a pink bloom that blooms from March to August. And the pollinators visit this. Next slide, please. Frog fruit. Phyla nodiflora is one of my superstars as far as ground covers. It grows in full sun to part shade. It's drought and flood tolerant. It has white blooms you can see on the right side that slide on the right. It blooms from May through November. Mine was blooming into December up until that Christmas freeze that we had. It grows in most any soil. It's nectar source for pollinators of all species. And it's the larval host plant for the Fayon crescent spot, buckeye, and white peacock butterflies. Next slide, please. So if you have an area of shade, there are other options for that as well. Pigeonberry, Ravina humulus, is a perennial herb. It grows up to one foot high. It grows well in the shade and moist environment, well-drained. It has pink blooms with scarlet red fruit that are loved by the birds. But be cautious, this, the leaves and the berries are toxic to humans, so it's, I wouldn't have that around humans or pets. Next slide, please. Inland sea oats is a low maintenance shade grass. It grows in part shade to shade, two to four feet high, blue-green bamboo-like leaves and oak oat-like seed heads that gracefully arch and turn yellow gold to brown in the fall. It grows in most soils with medium water requirements. The seeds are eaten by the birds and small mammals. The stems and leaves become nesting material for birds. And it's a larval host plant for three skipper butterflies. All of these native ground covers are on display at the Genoa Friendship Garden. Next slide, please. 
Then you can plant different types of gardens. Take an area and make, make it an herb garden or a native plant garden, a pollinator garden, or an edible area, a vegetable garden. So you can, these are other options that you can choose for your, your yard. Next slide, please. If you have a low feed area or a place that is the St. Augustine tends to have fungal problems, why not just give in to nature and make it a water feature, a rain garden, fountain bird bath or pond, bog. There are plenty of native plants uh, that will be grow well in that kind of environment. Next slide, please. Then we have a lot of options for natural materials. One of my favorite things to do is to mulch. I typically will use a an, an hardwood mulch. And I ask folks to consider adopting a more sustainable approach to life. As opposed to our linear economy of consuming and discarding, I recommend utilizing a circular economy. When I purchase something, asking the question, what am I going to do with it when I'm finished with it? Reuse and repurpose. If you're going to get a mulch, I recommend that you do not get one with dyes in it. Sometimes those dyes can be toxic to the environment. Typically a good natural quality hardwood mulch. And often they're the least expensive. And these type of options, you can see they may not last a long time and it might adjust your soil condition. So it's good to keep track of that. And then it may also provide additional nutrients. I love hardwood mulch that it nourishes the soil as it degrades, becomes compost. Next slide, please. So these are some options that you can use for your, for your lawn alternatives. Tree trunk slices, recycled lumber. Be sure it's not treated lumber though. And a natural rock pathway. Next slide, please. Then rocks and gravel can make a nice addition to a, a pathway or to a border, an edge, or an area that you're having difficulty with the, the turf grass. Next slide, please. And also permeable hardscapes. It's important to be thinking about impact on the environment. If I pave over an area, I've just told the water, you cannot soak into the ground here. And so it's important to have permeable options. Next slide, please. So gravel filled concrete pavers or solid porous concrete pavers. These are all options that allow the moisture to matriculate back down into the soil, into the aquifer instead of running off and becoming a, a flooding problem for us. Next slide, please. And so these show some other uh, pavers that are permeable. These are options. And again, it will help uh, mitigate floods. Next slide, please. And these are some low maintenance paver options that are actually living. And you can do this, next slide, or this. You can reuse glass bottles, reuse brick pieces. They're, the options are, are wide and as varied as your imagination and creativity. So I encourage you to think outside of the box when you're thinking of what to do for my, my yard. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, it's important. Uh, your lawn is an investment in your property. So be patient with your lawn, um, be diligent, take notes, remember what it needs from year to year and be creative. I think we can uh, learn to be more creative and think other options than we are used to. Next slide, please. Please come and visit us Monday and Wednesday mornings. I love to show the new native plant landscaping bed to folks and talk about how they can incorporate natives into your yard. Next slide shows where we're located and that, that red circle in the southeast corner of the Beltway is our Genoa Friendship, 1210 Genoa Red Bluff Road, Houston. Next slide. And this is the native plant. On the left, you see the grassy area that 
became the new bed, which is shown in the middle. I'd like to uh, to show this to folks. Right now, it's in full bloom, folks. You should come by and see it. In fact, tomorrow, we're going to have our workshop. Uh, please come by. You never know what you're going to go away with, maybe a plant or seeds. Normally, we're there Mondays and Wednesdays, 9 to 11 a.m., and you can see on the right-hand side, my friend and colleague, Noe Tristan. He's one of our many experienced master gardeners who love sharing our experience with you. Uh, he helped me extend the irrigation to this new demonstration bed. It's drip irrigation. Next slide, please. And this is the calendar, again, for our 2023 Green Thumb Gardening Series. Please come back next month and hear Jean Pfeffer talk on gardening with less water. Next slide. And this is our plant sale. We just had our last one at the General Friendship Garden this last weekend. And we have one more on the Northwest side uh, this Saturday. So please feel free to come by and check that out. Next slide. And then again, please come tomorrow and join us at nine o'clock. You can register. The link will be in the chat um, for our Lawn Alternatives Workshop. I'm going to be demonstrating, showing how to uh, the different native alternatives. Some of them we just saw on the slides, and I'm going to be giving them away to the participants. Next slide, please. Thank you for being here, and I appreciate. Do we have any questions? Yes, yes, we uh, were. The phones were lighting up, um, so uh, <laughs> we'll get to all these here uh, real quick. Um, Suzanne, we had a lot of questions about frog fruit. Um, Suzanne was asking, how do you uh, propagate frog fruit? Uh, she apparently has an abundance in her backyard. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. So come by tomorrow. I'll be demonstrating that very thing, and I'll be giving away frog fruit to the participants. And we'll have some, if they want to buy a, a number, then a, a donation. Anyway, we'll talk about that. But how to propagate it. So basically, frog fruit grows by stolons. Okay, it will grow out. And as that next nodule touches the ground, it'll have little roots. It will establish roots. So it goes by roots, but also by seed. Because as it blooms, if you let the flower go to seed, in other words, if you don't mow it, you let it go to seed, it will distribute and it will produce babies around. So it goes, it propagated both by stolons and by seed. And how many plants? I saw somebody asking how many plants. Good question. Um, how many, I just, the question was how many plants to start with if you replace, you know, to replace your San Augustine. It, you right, know. right. So <laughs> it's kind of like plugging with San Augustine. The more, the merrier, okay? How quickly do I want it to fill in? How patient am I, okay? Or how rich am I, <laughs> right? So it's a balance between those things. So basically, here in Houston, we have two growing seasons. And if you give it supplemental water when there's the dry periods, it will fill in if you plant it even within 12 inches within two growing seasons within the year. And so mm -hmm. that's about how far apart I put the plugs in my front yard that you saw in one of the pictures. And it took that, that full year for it to fill in. And now it's a thick carpet of frog fruit. And I'm, anytime I trim it, I can take those, those cuttings and I pot them up and I can give them away to folks. And oh, so, if, right. And so once you have these native plants, they propagate easily and you can share them with others or you can compost the extra. Yeah. Okay. And if you are going to remove, say, the San Augustine, is there a best way to, to remove old if you're going to change to something more native or is there a better way, better way to do that? I, I recommend not using uh, Roundup. OK, I recommend not using herbicide. Uh, the best way I have found, if you have the time and the patience and an endless supply of cheap labor, pull that turf up. <laughs> OK. <laughs> But most of us don't have that, and neither do I, but I understand that. So then I recommend a technique that Deborah actually mentioned in her January talk. It's called uh, basically lasagna composting. Okay, you cover, you, you cut down, you scalp the soil, the, the right. turf as, as low as you can get it, and then you cover it with cardboard. Three to five layers of cardboard. What you're going to do is you're going to cover, prevent the sun from getting to that turf grass. Then you're going to put on top of that 
your basis for your soil and you can start with just hardwood mulch. That's what I did in my front yard. You can also add compost or if you have some topsoil, you can bring that from the nursery, whatever you want, some type of mix and then plant your fr sprigs of frog fruit there and keep it moist while it's while it's spreading out. And while the frog fruit is developing and its own thick mat, that other is composting. Okay. Okay. I gotta, Robin, when you were doing this, like, and you all of a sudden started laying all this cardboard out on your front yard, did your neighbors call the authorities? Were they, I mean, <laughs> it seemed like. So we talk, we're talking cultural practices and, right. and yes, there are people who don't understand what I'm doing and it's not conventional. So yes, right. they, they don't understand and they'll, right. they'll complain to the HOA and, and I have, and I'm in communication with my HOA. I'm wanting to talk, have them come by so I can help them understand what I'm doing with my yard and why. And right. because it's a gradual process. So yes, it, it is odd. I'm the guy that pulls blades of St. Augustine out of my yard and I let the clover grow. So, but, but I've seen your pictures of your yard and it looks, your yard and it looks amazing. So uh, I just <laughs> had visions of laying out cardboard on the front yard and obviously you're then covering it with the, the hardwood mulch or whatever, but I just, I imagine getting some funny looks uh, from the neighbor. I do. That is, that's a part of, you know, changing a culture, right? Yeah, exactly. Why not? Um, yeah. Hey, uh, so another question here. Um, this comes in. Uh, will centipede grass work in Harris County? Okay. So I do not have experience with centipede grass, and it's not one that's recommended. Uh, so it's it's possible. Okay. But I don't have any, my own data Okay. On, the, on that information. That's a good question. If you have that, if you, want, if you want to, you can type in Ask a Master Gardener, and one of my colleagues will do that, will get that the one. research for you. So that's that's what I'd that's recommend. It. Our link, the link for that will be in the chat. That right is a good there, question. Yeah. yeah, that is a great question. We'll, uh, we'll put that in there. And if you don't know, uh, let's see if we have any other questions. You mentioned the HOA. That was kind of a question if, like, if some HOAs have types of grass requirements. Right. Which I'm just saying, you know, obviously contact your own. Absolutely. You uh, need to need to contact and see what are the requirements if you have an HOA. Some of them do require a specific type of turf grass. And if that's the case, then just talk with them and see what is allowable. What can I do? There you go. And of yeah. course, then we also want to promote your uh, um, Wednesday, which is just right around the corner. It's actually, oh, is it tomorrow? tomorrow? It's tomorrow, Tuesday. I'm sorry. It's tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow uh, morning. Yes. Tomorrow morning. There you go. Uh, so that would be, I have the 18th listed there, but that's the, that 19th. Would be the 19th. I'm so sorry. Let me pull no that up. And that's, uh, I got the wrong date there. I think I had it right. There we go. That's the one I was looking for. There you uh, go. 19th. There you go. So that's going to be at the, uh, at the, um, Genoa Friendships Gardens, which we showed the map of earlier. And of course, we have uh, another show coming up. Uh, we, someone did ask uh, how often we do this. We do this once a month. Uh, we do this on the third Tuesday of every month. So our next show is going to be uh, May 16th. And it'll be Gardening with Less Water. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that one because obviously, hopefully we, hopefully we don't need that one as much. But uh, uh, definitely uh, very important with Gardening with Less Water. And we need to be conserving as we go. So it's gonna be a great talk. Gene is a great resource. Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Well, once again, everybody, if you have questions, you can always, you know, uh, you know, check out the uh, ask a ask a Harris County Master Gardener, which we definitely recommend. Uh, we keep a archive of all of our shows on uh, both. I believe you do it on your on the Harris County Master Gardeners website, uh, but also we do on the Harris County Public Library. Uh, website and Facebook page. So uh, please um, uh, keep, uh, you know, you can go back and look at some, uh, if we might have had a topic that you, you know, really are looking for, we might have already covered it in previous months. So go back and check those out. Uh, Robin, any closing thoughts on, uh, on, on native grass, on grasses? <laughs> well, feel free to come by and ask us any questions. We're, we're there Mondays and Wednesdays and uh, we, we love to, to talk gardening. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much, Robin. We'll see everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.